Hey again all, thanks for coming back again for another exciting video on this abstract topic of bonding, different theories of bonding, different ideas. Um, here's yet another twist on the bonding idea. We have a lot of different models and theories for bonding because it's so complicated. Our observations don't always match any one particular theory. They don't necessarily contradict with each other, but uh, we need uh, lots of different models. So here's methane, CH4 very famous common molecule in our environment very useful burning things um, converting energy but the problem is we never see a carbon with one two three four um, orbitals of any kind that are available to bond with the hydrogen uh, we know carbon has some 2s a 2s orbital and some 2px 2py 2bz orbital but none of them are really arranged in a tetrahedron so we're wondering why the observed reality doesn't really uh, concur with the Lewis model or the uh, solutions to the Schrodinger equation for the um, atomic orbitals for carbon. Oh, so the idea is this, that uh, when these hydrogens approach or imagine these hydrogens approaching the carbon to bond with it, they sort of screw up or hybridize or um, tweak out the, the, uh, the orbitals. They don't look like they usually do. In other words, the 2s and the 2p orbitals of carbon get uh, sort of excited a little bit by the approach of the hydrogens and they kind of all blend together in the same level. This is a weird idea but it's been supported by calculation and observation theory and uh, looking very carefully and we see this kind of a thing where carbon does that gets all of its four valence electrons at the same energy level and the um, geometry the model of that geometry might look a little bit like this where I have an S2S orbital and three 2P orbitals and they kind of hybridize together so we blur them together in a blender or something spit them out and see what we get and we get uh, four, four sp3 orbitals each one the same but pointing toward different directions of the tetrahedron and indeed they're 109 and a half degrees away so in a sense maybe that helps us imagine how it could be that this uh, carbon methane uh, can have sp3 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 th four sp3 hybrid orbitals available to bond, i.e. to overlap with the 1s orbital of hydrogen, sharing an electron. Similar story for ammonia. Um, it doesn't really matter that one of those orbitals, hybrid orbitals, is being used uh, to occupy a lone pair. So this nitrogen has one, two, three, four still regions of electron density, and the hybridization is still sp3 on that central uh, nitrogen. There's another possibility though. Sometimes in multiple bonding, we don't have all the orbitals used. Perhaps one, two, three of the orbitals are used, and one of them is unused. So this one transfers right over here at the same level, but these three blend together to make what we call an sp2 hybrid, hybrid orbital. Notice that p2 is not p3, but 1s and 2p's, 1s and 2p's, but they all kind of equal out like that. And if I were to blend them up together, hybridize them in, in space, it might look something like this, where I have a 1s orbital, probably a 2s if I'm talking about carbon or oxygen or something, and two 2p orbitals, and they blend together to make a total of three orbitals, count them one, two, three, and that looks like that. Oh, a good example, this would be boron, wouldn't it? Boron trihydride or boron trifluoride with that trigonal planar um, configuration. But if it was carbon, oxygen, and such, I would, prop, I would still have one of those p orbitals not being used. If this is with the px and py, where's the pz? Well, it's right here still on top of this new hybrid orbital, but it's sticking out of the paper and into the paper, the screen. Um, so it's being unused. But it just doesn't sit there. It does something. It's looking for some bonding to happen. And so what will happen is... If this is the sp2 hybridized carbon, then I have an unused p orbital sticking up and down like this. Well, guess what? If it bonds with an oxygen, that oxygen may very well have an unused oxygen uh, p orbital uh, sticking up and down like this. So this direct overlap is called a sigma bond, a direct overlap of the hybridized or um, atomic orbitals, and an unused p orbital falls down this way and this way this way and this way. This is one hybrid, uh, this is one uh, sideways overlap orbital called called a pi bond. Um, yeah, and 
so the double bonding, if there's any double or bonding in a molecule, it turns out one of those bonds is a sigma bond, direct overlap, and the other one in the second or third in the bond is a sideways overlap of an unused p orbital. And that looks something like this. One unused orbital, another unused orbital. If they are on separate atoms, they'll kind of fall down upon each other or attract each other to form one orbital, a pi bond orbital, where two electrons can be shared in that orbital. This is a sigma bond direct overlap. You notice the difference, don't you? Uh, just another way to say the same thing. There's some funky notation for that, as you can see, but I don't think it's that crucial that you remember that notation like this. But it's interesting, the hybridization on the carbon is sp2. The hybridization on the hydrogen is just s hybridization, because it's just using an s orbital. This oxygen's using a, a, a p orbital right here, and an unused p orbital right here. Also has some lone pair going on, but I don't like that picture for that. Here's a good a good point. If carbon it only has single bond between a carbon and carbon, then that everything else around that zoom in a little bit. Everything else around that um, single bond is free to rotate wherever it wants to go. So this chlorine H two Cl uh, that can so these things can spin around. So can these things. So there's really no specific uh, or um, orientation on these chlorines are just like all over the place, although they probably would try to repel away a little bit from each other. But check this out. Um, if there is double bonding, that automatically, this sideways overlap of the unused p orbital is called the pi bond, that pi bond automatically fixes the chlorines in place so that they could be either on the same side as each other or the opposite side of the carbon as each other. Interesting. So that could lead to some cool polarity issues. Is the molecule polar or not? Um, yeah. So, here it's free to rotate with just a single bond, but if it has a double bond with one fewer hydrogen, no. Uh, okay, so this is this is, this is the same thing, and it's just saying this can rotate up to here or whatever, but if I fix the double bond in place, then that says they can be either on the same side, but they can't flip, this one can't flip up, or this one can't flip up, but if I broke the bond and somehow formed it differently, this is called uh, trans, where the chlorines are opposite each other. This is called cis on the same side. So interestingly, this one's lopsided because the bottom's definitely different. The dipole kind of would point, you know, like that. Here, they have a dipole moment going this way and dipole moment going this way, and they kind of cancel out. So this one's nonpolar. Interesting. Here's just some other space filling model of. Uh, retinal molecule and as an isomer. So the bonding being different um, on the 11-12 um, carbons. So if this was, um, let's see if this was flipped down the other way, which it could be, that molecule has a different, many different properties. Um, oh, here's an even di further diminished orbital. It's just an sp orbital, hybridized orbital. So it might look like this. And if I just use an S and a P, one S and one P, then I just get two hybridized orbitals and two unused uh, P orbitals that could possibly look for something to do, like this. So here I have my acetylene molecule with one pi overlap and another pi overlap, one top down, one front back. So the first one right here, the purple one, that's a sigma bond. And then the two other bonds are this one and this one and back. Crazy. Sideways overlap of unused p orbitals, pi bonding. So they're easy to count if you see. Well, let me get to that in a minute. Uh, here's the hybridization on arsenic uh, pentachloride. It just kind of goes crazy. So arsenic's expanding its octet. So I don't just go sp3, I dip into the d's as well. And uh, I gotta, you know, get enough hybrid orbitals to accommodate all of those um, bonded uh, atoms. So it would look like this, where I dip into the D's, and so if I have one, two, three, four, five hybridized orbitals, one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, that's trigonal bipyramidal, or just the same thing, and the same thing. 
So there's hybrid there's uh, hybrid orbitals associated with these uh, with each molecular geometry. Or if I go even further, perhaps I'll dip into the another D. This is about as far as we'll go. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, yeah, hybridized orbitals, and they kind of look like that to confirm the octahedral geometry. Uh, octahedral geometry and octahedral geometry. And so that sulfur just goes crazy and it's this expansion and hybridization. And here are the, uh, you know, reminder of the hybridized uh, orbital names and geometries. Uh, let's see. This bromine has lone pairs, but the lone pairs still count in the hybridization. So one, two, three, four, five, and that would be one with the sp3d or hybridization, right? Yeah, right. Count the number of um, electron densities. Here's a carbon. This is sp3, sp3, but uh, oh no, this is sp2 because this only has one, two, three regions of electron density around it. One unused p orbital that bonds with the oxygen. Boy, I took that out of order. I apologize. There's my sp3d hybridization on the bromine. Uh, yeah, it's way out of order. I apologize. But flip around. Here's my carbon-carbon single bond. But if it has unused p orbital, that somehow we got restricted in the number of hydrogens allowed to the carbon, it could quite possibly form that pi bond. Oh, darn! Hang on a second. Alright, I'm back. I apologize. I had to sneak that down a little bit just in case you wanted to see it. Um, what's the C? Eh, not much. <laughs> the carbon has one, two, three regions of electron density, so that's an sp2 hybridization. One unused p orbital on each carbon, and so they fall down upon each other to make that extra. This is a carbon carbon single, carbon carbon double bond. That This thing right here is a, the pi bond. Alright, let me sneak way back up to the top then. This all seems very complicated, but you know what? There's a simple, simple way to summarize it. We just start counting. 1s, 3ps, 5ds, but rarely do we go beyond this. Count the number of regions of electrons in density around that central atom, and that's how many of those orbitals are used to hybridize together, to blend together, to achieve the necessary uh, bonding and lone pair configuration that you might see on any one particular uh, call it a central atom. So the sp3 is the usual octet because 2, 4, 6, 8 and that's the octet. Anything less than that might be double bonding or boron, triple bonding. Anything more than that is just an expanded octet that that central atom might have. So stealing from a previous video, which I don't mind doing, uh, if I have uh, just a linear molecule, all these central atoms have one, two regions of electron density around them, so it's just called SP, SP hybridization. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two. And what if I go trigonal planar? Well, if it's trigonal planar, I have one, two, three regions of electron density around that central atom, so it's SP2. That's one, two, three, one, two, three um, orbitals of that boron hybridized. Same story here for the carbon and the sulfur in the carbonate and the SO2 molecule, uh, sp2 hybridization, one, two, three, one, two, three, so the lone pairs count. And tetrahedron is sp3 hybridization on methane, we looked at that already, or ammonia, we looked at that already, and even the lone pairs count, one, two, three, four regions, and so one, two, three, four, even, oops, sorry, I'm getting in a hurry, water has one, two, three, four, regions of electron density, sp3, the usual, or going beyond. I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 1, 3, 4, 5, 1, 3, 4, 5, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 orbitals hybridizing together. Same story there for all of those, bizarre shapes, and sp, last one, sp3d2, which goes two beyond the usual octet. And so, hmm. I wish I could ask if you have any questions, but you couldn't ask me anyway. But you asked me in class, right? All right. Sometimes we'll look at molecules and try to identify hybridization. Notice nitrogen and oxygen don't always, don't always have their lone pairs mentioned, so I should take those into account. But if I have a one, two, three, 
that's an sp3 hybridization. The double bond doesn't count as an extra region of electron density, it's actually just an unused p-orbital on this nitrogen and this carbon. So yeah, uh, this carbon here has one, two, three things around it, so it's sp2 hybridized. This carbon has one, two, three, four things around it, sp3. This nitrogen has one, two, three, four, sp3. So over there's four regions, sp3. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. But wherever there are fewer, so there's one, two, three around this carbon. So that's sp2 hybridization. We might also sometimes ask about the geometry about that carbon, uh, or about that central atom, or the atom in question. And again, the geometry is just determined by the hybridization, or the number of electron density regions. So wherever I have one, two, three regions, sp2, one, two, three regions, sp2, but wherever I have three, four regions, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, that's uh, sp3 hybridization. Oh, that's a mouthful. Thanks, guys. I think that's all I have to say for now. But think about the geometries. If it's sp3 hybridized, then it's tetrahedral about that carbon. If it's sp2 hybridized, then it's uh, trigonal planar about that carbon. See you in class. Thanks for watching. Seriously.